Hi, I'm Joe Crawford. Welcome to part one of my lessons in rendering with V-Ray in Maya. This is going to be a pretty simple exercise. We'll all go over the general workflow involved in using V-Ray and rendering in general. Uh, we'll only be dealing with an extremely simple scene in this lesson, since it'll be the simplest way to explain the basics of rendering and uh, using V-Ray together in Maya. So the first thing that we need to do is make sure that V-Ray is active and working. Uh, we can do this by using the plugin manager in Maya. So we can go to Windows, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager, um, and then you can scroll down this list until you find the V-Ray section, and uh, find where it says V-Ray for Maya.mll, and uh, turn on so it's loaded, and check Auto Load. And then we can close this, uh, and then V-Ray will be active. And then if you actually want to render uh, using V-Ray, uh, you can go into your main render settings, and you can just make sure that render using is set to V-Ray right here. And then you'll be uh, able to use V-Ray. So now that we have V-Ray working, let's just take a look at this simple scene that we have. Um, we basically just have an object functioning as a ledge uh, on which we can place some other objects. Um, and this is just gonna have a very simple material. Um, and then we got a couple uh, blocks here. Uh, we're gonna make this like a green plastic block and this just like an orange plastic block. Uh, it's gonna be a really simple scene. So right now everything's just at the default settings. Uh, so if I activate um, this view and I hit our render button right here, then we'll render the view. It doesn't quite look like our scene yet, uh, but this is working. So we can see that, uh, that it is rendering in V-Ray. This is the V-Ray frame buffer window that pops up. So V-Ray's got its own um, render window that actually works a lot better than the built-in one in Maya. So I'm glad that they have their own. So obviously we need to change a lot of settings in here. So uh, let's get into that. So we'll go into the render settings. Uh, so the first tab here, uh, once we've set up to be rendering in V-Ray, the first tab that we'll see is V-Ray Common. So uh, first off, you just want to give it a name. Um, something like test is fine for us for this situation. Um, you know, keep it simple. Uh, you know, underscores between words. Just use uh, letters and numbers. Make sure it starts with a letter, not a number, uh, for the name. And then we can go down for the image format. Uh, we'll choose EXR since it's generally the best image format that we have available to us. Um, and then what we can also do is we can make sure that we get the absolute highest quality EXR files. So we can go into the image format options and we can choose for compression type, we can choose uh, PIZ uh, and that's lossless compression. So it's 100% perfect quality that it sees if it can make the file size any smaller without actually uh, damaging the image quality at all. And then we have our bits per channel and we'll set that to 32 bits full float, which is sort of the highest quality that we can set the colors at. And then uh, this will be sufficient for now. So let's go to close. Uh, so now we've got our basic save set up. Uh, we can see right now it's just going to go into my currently set Maya project. So we've got cubes in V-Ray Maya, and that's the current project um, that's going to go into. And right now it's just going to go in the root of that folder. If you want it to go uh, somewhere else, you can uh, you know add additional information here or change your project settings. Uh, I'm fine with it just going in here for now. Uh, if we scroll down, we see right now we have our renderable camera. It says uh, perspective. I want to render the camera ultimately, but we don't even have a camera yet, so we're going to make that in a second. Uh, if we go down just a little bit lower, though, we see resolution. Um, and what I want to talk about here is the fact that a lot of times when people render, I see people rendering resolutions that are way higher than they need to to be doing initial tests. Uh, and it really slows people down um, when they're rendering high resolutions at times when they really don't need it. So the best thing that you can do as a general strategy, when you're, particularly when you're testing early on, is just try to do a lot of renders at very low resolution to figure out your lighting and your materials and all your sort of like main sort of ballpark things. Get it all generally working well. And, uh, you know, only really crank that resolution up towards the very end. You know, maybe temporarily put it up just when you need to check something accurately. Um, you know, but then turn it back down again. So as a beginning resolution, you know, you can go as low as something like 320 for width or 400. Um, for this example, just because I want it to be sort of big enough to show you, I'll go to 640 by 360. Uh, but even that is higher than I would normally go just to do some basic previews. Um, but I think for our purposes here, given this relatively simple scene, um, this will work well. And this will just give us really fast feedback. We won't be waiting a long time on the renders uh, since it's a relatively small setting. Uh, and then we can always crank that up later when it's final render time.
Now I should mention that to actually see the V-Ray render view, we can hit show V-Ray VFB right here, the V-Ray frame buffer. So if I click that, then we'll actually uh, see the render view. And it hasn't updated to my new resolution because I haven't actually hit render again yet. Um, so we do that. And then if you have a V-Ray tab right here, then the other way that you can open that up um, is just going in here and going to the show V-Ray VFB. And you can hit that button and it'll come up again as well. Uh, and finally, you can use a mail command. So if you don't have that button and you need to make your own command, uh, which I actually did right here, uh, if you want to make a button for that, so let's just right click and delete my old one. Uh, so if I want to make a new button for this, I could just write at the mail command, I can write vray show vfb. Uh, the capitalization matters, it has to be exactly like this. So um, it's all lowercase except for the S in show and the VFB at the end, um, which are uppercase. So then I'll put uh, two parentheses, so an opening parentheses, a closing parentheses, and a uh, semicolon. And I can grab all this and hold down the middle mouse button and drag it to my shelf. I'll let go, say Mel, uh, and now I have a button for it. So I can click on that button there, and that'll pop it up if it's not already showing. Uh, if you want to customize that button, you can right-click on it, and you can say Edit. And then you can go to the shelves, and where it says Icon Label here, I can see uh, right now I've got these two commands. I guess it didn't delete mine properly the first time, so let's just hit the trash can on one of them. And then for Icon Label here, I can just write VFB, hit Save All Shelves, and now it'll actually show the VFB command right there. So if for some reason you've lost the V-Ray shelf or something like that, um, or if you need to put this into another script that you're using, um, then that's the command for it, which is pretty useful. So let's move over to the main uh, V-Ray settings. Um, if we take a look at our render here, the first thing that we'll notice is that everything's round in the viewport and everything's completely blocky and angular in here. So everything's just completely hard boxes. Uh, there's no roundness to any of the edges in our render. Uh, and that's because right now, even though in these objects I've, uh, I've turned the Smooth Mesh Preview on, which is what happens when you select an object in Maya and you push 3. So again, I can toggle between the you know simple polygon model and the more complicated um, Catmull Clark subdivision version, or in this case using Open Subdiv. Uh, I can hit 3, right, and then we'll see the smooth subdivided one um, using the Smooth Mesh Preview inside of uh, Maya that's applied to the shape node. And you'll see when I push one and three on the keyboard, that's just changing that setting. And you see it's using um, the open subdiv Catmull Clark method there. That's how it's smoothing it. So uh, if we want to actually get V-Ray to respect this, um, there's a couple things that we need to do. Uh, the simplest thing that we can do is we can just go into global options and we can turn on render viewport subdivision. And that's all we'll do for now, and it'll be good enough. Uh, we can ultimately get more control by putting specific open subdiv settings on it, or by adding specific settings um, for V-Ray's internal subdivision. So there's other options that we can use, but this will be sufficient for now. And just by turning this button on um, and going in here and doing another render, we can now see that everything gets rounded out. Um, so that'll be good. Now that's using the real render. There is another um, previewing mechanism in V-Ray um, and it gets used when you use the IPR render in Maya. And it's V-Ray RT and it's essentially V-Ray's uh, previewing system. Um, so I'm using, you know, I'm showing the actual render settings here and they're actually kind of at preview settings right now anyway, but they have an actual separate uh, system for the previewing, which is called their V-Ray RT engine. Uh, if we go in there, we can actually uh, take a look at some of the options. And if we want to see things actually get rounded out in our previews, we're gonna have to turn on subdivision here. Because if I turn on, uh, or if I just go to the IPR and I use the IPR right here, so if I activate this view, uh, I'll hit just to escape to cancel any existing renders going on. And then if I hit IPR right up here, um, we'll see that everything's just um, you know completely sharp edges again, nothing's rounded off. Uh, and that's because the RT engine um, isn't respecting those subdivision settings yet either. So we can just go in here where it says subdivision in the RT settings. I'll turn that on. 
and I'll activate this view and I'll hit the IPR again. There we go. And now that's working. Um, so for the initial part of this lesson, we'll be using this IPR system. Uh, and then when we're close to the end, we'll switch over to, you know, checking out some of the actual render settings, getting that to work. And then, you know, finally we'll adjust those to final render settings. One note of caution, just remember that uh, this RT engine doesn't properly support all of V-Ray's different materials and effects. So there are times when it's not going to work if you use the RT engine. You're going to see different results in your preview. So you know, with simple scenes, this should be okay. Um, but there you know, are going to be situations where it's not going to be accurate. So it is important to go back and check your actual renders once in a while. Um, you know, sometimes it's just certain objects that look different and things like that. Um, so often you can use the RT engine um, even when you still don't see certain effects in the previews because you can always just know that those effects are looking good by doing real renders and you can just use the RT engine to tweak um, whatever is working in the RT engine and then tweak the other stuff by going back and doing real renders. Um, so you know, you, you can switch back and forth uh, and you'll often find the RT engine is useful for small bits and then you'll have to go into other sections. Uh, and either do, you know, just do uh, preview renders, you know, renders with low settings, renders at low resolutions, uh, things like that, but using the sort of full V-Ray renderer as opposed to the previewing RT engine. Um, now, before we really do anything, it's really important that um, we get a camera going in the scene because right now we're just working with the uh, default perspective view or persp, as it says here, uh, since they've just shortened it. Um, but really, that means the perspective view, and this is just the default camera in Maya. Um, you know, this is the camera that we use for working with Maya. And we want to have a camera here that's, you know, locked down and that I'm not going to accidentally move into different positions so I can kind of compose my final shot. Um, and we also might want to apply certain attributes for rendering on that camera. So in order to do this, I'm just going to make a new camera. Uh, and a really easy way to do that uh, is to just say view, create camera from view. So if I do this, I'll get a new camera. Uh, it's going to be very similar, though. It's going to be placed in the same uh, you know, position, essentially seeing the same things as uh, the older perspective view. You'll see now it's called uh, Pers1, or for Perspective1, uh, just so it has a, a different name than the old one. But I want to rename this um, myself. Since this is our camera, we want to remember that. Let's go to View, Select Camera. We'll say Cam, and that's going to be really obvious that that's the camera. That's what we're intending to render from. You know, and then we could go in here and we could make some uh, some slight alterations if we wanted to to that shot. Uh, but once we had actually, you know, something we liked here, we could go in. And there's a couple things we could do. We could key it. So I could right click. I could hit uh, say key selected. Uh, I could also lock these attributes so I don't accidentally move them. Um, and then I could do the same thing with the focal length on the camera here, on the shape node of the camera. And that's where the camera's like the rest of its settings other than where it is and how it's how it's pointing. Uh, most of the other settings are all gonna be in the actual camera shape node. So the focal length, which controls the field of view uh, is ultimately gonna be in there. So I can do the same thing. I can just key that uh, and or lock that. Yeah. So by doing that, now it's going to be impossible for me to accidentally, like, you know, orbit this camera. Like, if I hold down Alt and I click in this view to try to orbit it, you know, I'm not going to lose my camera. Um, so if it's an if it's an animation, just make sure you're keyframing your camera so that it, you know, remembers where it is when you go and you slide the time slider. Um, you know, if it's still, you can just lock it. That's fine. So once I've got it um, in here, uh, now I'm going to be able to actually, you know, control that camera. Uh, and you know, change the individual app, um, attributes on that camera. You know, since I now have a dedicated object for it, um, and if I want to just you know freely orbit around the scene, you know, and I can just go down to my perspective view and just you know do whatever I want in there, because it's its own view, and now I'm not messing up what the camera is doing. So let's take another uh, quick render here. Um, we see this warning down at the bottom. Uh, and honestly, this is just about our like save image settings. Um, this warning is not something that affects us in any way. It's basically talking about the settings it would use if we're saving a target. So this can be very safely ignored. Um, we're saving EXR images and we've already set that up to work. Uh, so that part is fine. So we can just ignore this particular warning. So now if we want to continue uh, 
working with this, I think the next thing that we have to do is get some lighting because what we have right now is just the default Maya lights. Um, and we want to control this um, ourselves properly. So let's go and uh, even though we're going to create a, a sort of daylight shot here in the end, let's just go in and just to sort of understand how V-Ray works, let's go in and create a V-Ray uh, sphere light. So we can just go create lights, V-Ray sphere light, and click on that. Now we'll get this. Um, I just move it up here a little bit. And then um, what we'll do, just so we can kind of understand what's happening with this light, is we'll change the uh, the radius. So right now it's going to be so small. Um, and it's also quite dim because by default, um, the light's brightness is related to its size. We're going to change that later. Um, but by default, um, those things are actually tied together. So if I render this by default, actually, sorry, let's use the IPR again. So if I use the IPR here again, you're going to see it's just very, very dark. I can barely even see what's happening. Uh, whereas if I go to my radius here and I type in something like 16, uh, this should be a lot more reasonable. So let's IPR render that again. Yeah, so you said that's brighter. Um, and actually, because I am using the IPR here, um, I don't even have to re-render this. Uh, when I change sliders and things like that, the IPR will generally update real time. So this started off at one, and if I put it one, we'll see that it's dark there right away. And that's the nice thing about this V-Ray RT or IPR uh, rendering is that we can see sort of very quick previews of what we're doing really fast. Um, so we'll set this to 16. And now what I want to point out is that these are the default units and the default units, they don't really have any proper real world relevance or at least not that I know of. Uh, so what I think makes a lot more sense um, is to use something that has a much better real world reference point. Um, so if we go into, into uh, units here, we can choose lumens and in real life, uh, you know, when we manufacture lights, things like that, there's actually a specific uh, number for any given light. There's a specific uh, number of lumens that it would say on the label when you were buying it at the store or something. Um, you know, so for like regular bulbs, they're going to be maybe around 1600 lumens. So once I do that, you're going to see that right away it goes in here and it changes this intensity multiplier to be a totally different number. Um, and we'd have to set up a lot of other things to get all this to make sense. Um, but the nice thing now is if I, if I change our radius, you'll see that our scene doesn't change in brightness anymore because the lumens represents the uh, total visible light energy that's leaving that light. So the radius isn't affecting it anymore. Now if I want to affect the, the brightness, I've just got this intensity multiplier. So now I can adjust it just by using this. Um, and that is going to give me uh, better control over it. Now this slider, of course, by default is way too low, so I can go in here and type in a much big, bigger number, um, you know, and then change this slider again somewhere. But I'll leave it around like that for now. Now the other thing you'll notice is when the radius is really small, we get really, really sharp shadows. And when the radius is higher, um, such as 16, or 32, or possibly even bigger than that, uh, the higher that that gets, the blurrier these shadows are going to be as they um, get farther away from the shadow caster. So right near where the cube is, where it's casting a shadow on the floor, right close to it, the shadow on the floor is quite sharp, even though we have a large light. Um, but as we move farther and farther away, you'll we'll see that shadow getting more and more blurry as it gets farther away. Um, and that's the way that shadows work in real life. Um, and you can really control this in V-Ray just by controlling the size of the light. Just keep in mind that when you're using larger lights, they are normally going to take a lot longer to render. So when you want this kind of soft lighting with the nice soft uh, shadows and everything, which very often will look really good, the one thing is that that is fairly expensive in terms of um, computational power. So the computer has to spend quite a long time thinking about that stuff. It requires a lot of uh, samples, and there are controls that you can uh, that you can change uh, to affect um, how long that takes to render. But I mean, as you'll see when I uh, you know if I restart the IPR here, you'll see that it starts off really really grainy, right? And it only gets better over time. 
And this is an extremely simple scene. Uh, and in more complicated scenes, of course, they would take much longer to sort of clean themselves up and get better. But a general rule when we're rendering, something that we're going to find most of the time is blurrier, softer effects tend to take a lot more time to render than um, you know sharp reflex. Like sharp reflections um, and sharp shadows, they're generally going to render a lot faster. Um, in terms of getting a clean render that doesn't have a lot of noise in it, um, we're going to be able to get to a clean render a lot faster when we're using uh, sharper shadows, um, you know, sharper reflections, things like that. I mean, it's still cleaning this up from the last render. If I zoom into this one spot, let's just uh, let's just go into IPR again, and this will effectively restart the IPR render. So let's just click this. Um, yeah, so now we're restarting, and it's just incredibly grainy at the beginning, um, and then it you know gradually gets better. Well, if I hit escape here and I just cancel that, if I go back into my light and I take the radius here, and let's say I make it one, okay, so now this is going to be a pretty sharp edge. So now you're going to see it doesn't take very long at all to clean up that edge, right? It, it comes out, you know, it, it gets, you know, pretty nice relatively fast. Uh, and that's just because uh, it requires a lot less uh, computations, you know, to figure out these hard edge things. Uh, it's all due to sampling theory. Um, and we'll talk about sampling theory more uh, later, but for now, um, just understand that it's generally blurrier effects are going to get be a lot slower to render. Now we also want to turn on another kind of effect, which is called uh, global illumination. So let's uh, set this light um, back to being fairly large again. I'll put this radius at 32, uh, so we can see a fair amount of bounce light, or, or so that we'll be able to get a fair amount of bounce light, uh, because right now there's no bounce light happening in the scene. Uh, and that's because the default settings have global illumination turned off, and global illumination is what causes light bouncing around. If I go into my V-Ray render settings, right here, uh, and we go over to the GI tab, then we can see our settings for the global illumination. So right now, there is no global illumination, meaning that light isn't bouncing around through our scene. Um, you know, so certain places on here are like extremely dark because there is no light that are that's bouncing into those areas. Uh, so if I want to improve that a little, um, what I can do here is I can go and I can turn GI on. Turn GI on, uh, hit escape to can really stop that render and then hit IPR just to get it going again. And immediately it's going to get quite a bit grainier because we're now asking the computer to do a lot more rendering work. But what you're going to see is we're going to start getting um, you know, small amounts of light uh, showing up in these areas that otherwise would have been 100% pitch black, because now we're getting some bounce lighting in there. Uh, and particularly when you have you know, softer lighting environments and things like that, you'll, be, you'll start getting a lot more bounce lighting happening in those places. Um, and you know, since in real life, uh, light bounces all the time, um, you know, light light bounces just a tremendous number of times um, off of various you know surfaces, just in any real world situation. So, if you really want to get very uh, realistic looking renders at all, you, generally speaking, you have to use um, you know GI and you have to get it uh, done pretty well, uh, and that's going to handle all your light bouncing around. Now, later on, there's some better settings that we can use to kind of accelerate this, um, but the settings that we have uh, right now, uh, since we're using the IPR engine. Um, they're all basically the equivalent of the brute force settings in V-Ray, which uh, the computer doesn't really use any methods of, uh, of accelerating it too drastically. Um, you know, it just goes and it tries to sample everything accurately and figure out how, you know, how it would actually work. Um, the only real um, inaccuracy is the fact that it limits sort of the number of bounces. And I mean, I can turn this up. I could go into my uh, GI depth and turn that up. And you're basically going to see very little difference because once light's bounced a few times, you know, it gets so dim that you can't even tell what's happening. So it's not generally worthwhile to have the GI depth all that terribly high. That's basically how many times the light can bounce. In your final renders, it'll be a little bit higher than this. But, um, you know, for the RT engine, uh, a GI depth of like 3 is just fine. You know, particularly doing your previews. Um, so we're getting a little bit of bounce light in there right now. Um, 
but I think right now we'll uh, get rid of this light and we'll move towards kind of the final lighting situation that I want to work on, which is um, sort of exterior daylight. And that'll be uh, sort of a more complete uh, lighting environment where we get a combination of the sun and the sky and everything. Um, so we'll just go in and we'll remove this light. So here's our, our point light. So we can remove that, we'll just get completely dark. And now we're going to create a, a sun and sky. And I'm going to use V-Ray's built-in sun and sky for this. Um, you can use them um, you know, in, in most outdoor situations. And by the way, you can use the V-Ray sun without using the V-Ray sky. You can actually use them separately. So if you want to use your own control for the sky, you know, use your own image or something for the sky, that's fine. Um, but I can do this just by going uh, back into the V-Ray tab here. And uh, I'll close up that image sampler setting. I'll close up the global option setting. Um, and I'll go back to my V-Ray sun and sky setting right here. Um, so to create this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit my create sun uh, button. I'm going to hit my create sky button. OK, and we're going to get a sun and sky uh, system going. But right away, we're actually going to notice it's incredibly bright. Now, this, in a sense, is actually correct because the, the light brightness is fine right now. It's actually accurate. Um, the problem is that our camera settings are not at all accurate. We haven't tweaked our camera to be anything like a real world camera. Um, so right now everything's just completely blowing out. Now, ideally, I think it makes sense. Uh, I definitely consider it best practice to use real world light levels. You know, if you can use real world sizes, real world light levels, real world camera settings, you know, if you can do all these things, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a lot of control. You'll be able to get really realistic looking shots. You'll be able to match, um, you know, things that have been shot on a film set or something. If you know, like the settings, the camera settings that they were filming things in or filming things with, and you want to match that, uh, maybe to do some visual effects or something, right? If you want to be able to, uh, you know, use those physical numbers from a, you know, real world situation, you know, such as a film set, um, you know, it's important that you're using um, physical units for everything. Um, so, you know, for example, the scene size in this case, you know, I have a cube here. Well, that cube is 64 for width, height, and depth. Now that means 64 centimeters because Maya's default units is centimeters. Um, and, you know, V-Ray understands that properly and will work uh, with that correctly. Um, so, you know, make sure you have accurate measurements in terms of uh, centimeters um, in here. And then basically if you, you can use real world settings for the lights uh, and I said to do that with the lumens earlier so if you actually use lumens um, for light sources you know other than the sun in the sky um, but for any sort of artificial light sources like a light bulb or something you can use lumens and then uh, finally uh, for your camera we can use a physical camera as well and then we can sort of have all of our settings uh, reflecting real world settings so we go into view and we can go to select camera and we'll do this uh, in our camera, sorry. So view, select camera, there we go. And now we can see the camera shape node right here. Um, and we're gonna apply some V-Ray settings that are gonna give this some um, uh, physically, um, some physically based settings. So we'll go to attributes, V-Ray, physical camera. And now we're gonna get the kind of settings that a real life camera would actually have. So I can scroll down to where it says extra V-Ray attributes. I can open this up and the first attribute that I'm going to turn on is treat as V-Ray physical camera. So I can turn that on and then right away we're going to get something that makes some kind of sense. Now there is a general rule called um, called Sunny 16. Um, the default camera settings here work reasonably well um, for a sunny day uh, but the Sunny 16 uh, rule is a good one to know and if you go over to you know, Wikipedia, you look up the Sunny 16 rule, you'll see there's essentially some simple rules for, um, you know, getting outdoor photographs, um, you know, where there's a bright sun and, and uh, you know, daylight, and you're trying to take a nice picture of daylight. Uh, we have some general rules here. And basically, if we use an F number of 16, then we can make the, uh, the ISO 200 and we can make the shutter speed uh, 1 over 200, which are essentially that's what the shutter speed here in V-Ray means. It's 1 over 200 as well. And then the ISO here can match. So 
if I set these all to sort of those general rules, then that's something that like real photographers might do in real life as a general rule, just sort of as a starting place, right? So I could say 16, and then you're gonna notice it all gets a little bit too dark, but I can go back in and I can you know, turn this up again. Um, and then it would largely come down to where the sun was. Um, and if we're doing something on like a fairly sunny day where the sun is you know, fairly high in the sky, then we might want to um, turn that intensity up a little bit. So obviously uh, the brightness of the sun is based on um, you know, where it is in the sun at a given, at a given time of day. Uh, and then we can also we can also change some of these settings to be a bit of a clearer sky. So this V-Ray sun is sort of by default tied into the sky system. Um, you know, I could go in here with this uh, turbidity and I could turn it down a little and we'll effectively get the equivalent of like a clearer, a clearer sunnier day. There we go. So there's going to be different settings that you could use, um, you know, for indoor scenes, uh, nighttime scenes, stuff like that. You can use different camera settings uh, by using those settings and then by using sort of real, real world um, light settings, or, uh, particularly, um, you know, when you're using artificial light sources like with lumens and whatnot, then you can get much more realistic renders. Uh, you know, in this situation, we can hit something in the ballpark of sunlight very quickly. It works pretty well. We know we're, we know we're in the right general area here. Um, so we can start getting towards some materials now. So now we can set up some materials for this scene. So let's, uh, let's just try and make a couple, uh, you know, simple plastic materials uh, for these blocks here. Uh, so to do this, we can use V-Ray materials. So if we just right click on here and say assign new material. Uh, we can use the V-Ray material right here, and you can use these V-Ray materials for most objects. They can really uh, represent a really wide range of materials, you know, everything from um, a lot of organic materials to plastics, glass, um, metals, you know, all kinds of different things. There's a really wide range. Um, and if we just use a few basic settings, we can actually match, um, you know, most 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 of the world's sort of simpler surfaces. Uh, and there are obviously additional effects that um, you can use beyond this, but this can be um, you know, used to represent, I would say probably 90% of the models in a given scene. Um, you know, the, these V-Ray materials are gonna work on most things. So let's we'll take a look at the you know, important settings on here. So first off, that's a really good habit to name your materials. So we're gonna call this, um, you know, green block mat. There we go. I'll put mat on the end since it is a material. Um, I have a general uh, rule in Maya of using descriptive names that are separate by an underscore, and then using two underscores and then indicating the type of thing at the end after the two underscores. Um, that's just my own naming convention. You can read my document about naming conventions if you want to see more of sort of the reasoning behind naming conventions. Um, but for now, I'll just be naming things this way. Um, so we can take a look at the diffuse color here, and I said I wanted this to be green, so the diffuse color is going to be the main color of this object. Um, and this is going to be the diffused or scattered light color, which you know, we see as the main color for things that aren't you know, really, really, really reflective, and obviously plastic isn't, um, isn't the sort of sharp reflections where it looks like a mirror. Um, so it's pretty dominated by diffuse color. Okay, so there's a base there. Um, and then we also have a roughness amount. And this roughness amount is going to give you um, a transition between some sort of different um, different kinds of math that will get you be used for the shading. So this is just um, it's effectively the type of programming um, that's being used to shade this surface. Um, and there's different shading models uh, that have been designed so we can go into uh, Wikipedia and take a look at this page on the uh, Oranea reflectance model, and you'll see that they effectively uh, explain um, what this Oranea shading is, and then they also show us what this uh, you know typical Lambert shading is. You're probably very familiar with Lambert shading if you're using Maya, since that's the default shading on most things. Um, if we scroll down here, though, we can find a nice example 
where we can find you know Lambert style shading, and then we can find this Orinaire style shading, and we can see that the Orinaire style shading uh, for some objects is actually going to match up a lot better with real life, um, you know, than Lambert style shading. However, there's other objects in real life where the Lambert style shading is going to be a lot closer. So you know, it's one of those things where you don't necessarily want one thing or the other. Um, and fortunately, uh, V-Ray can give us a nice transition between one or the other, anywhere in between. Um, so for something like this, uh, we probably wouldn't want this very high. Plastic would be, um, you know, a little bit lower on the scale, I would, I would assume. And we'll go down and find our reflectivity settings underneath here. Uh, and this is going to be for the shininess here. So there's no specular um, slider because V-Ray just uses reflections, you know, for all specularity, which is closer to real life anyway. Uh, so, you know, essentially your specular control just is your reflection color. So I can turn this up. Uh, we don't want to turn this up too terribly high. Um, but we can turn this up a little, and then the thing that we really want to do is we want to take the glossiness down so that it blurs out the reflections enough and kind of can give us a nice soft highlight on it there. So let's take that down. You know, that's looking pretty plasticky. Uh, and then finally, we can control uh, the reflective IOR of the surface. Um, and we can just uncheck this box here. Um, and then slide this slider around. And really, plastic should not be that terribly high. So let's try 1.8 or something. That looks like it's working reasonably well. Um, so this IOR is basically going to control the fall off of the reflections from the glancing angles to the forward angles. And you'll see here that the forward angles really don't have very much reflectivity and the glancing angles have a lot of reflectivity. And if you turn the uh, IOR down, as the IOR gets down closer to one, um, you'll start seeing like, you know, no reflectivity at all um, at the front and very little at the sides until like the really extreme glancing angles will have a tiny bit. And then, uh, as it goes higher, if I start dragging this higher instead of lower, um, then as I drag this higher, we'll just start getting tons of reflections everywhere. And if I take this really high, then you know we'll just be seeing, um, you know, all kinds of glossy highlights all over the object, which we really don't want something like that. Particularly when there's diffuse color as well, because that diffuse color, um, you know, wouldn't be as strong if there was so much reflectivity. So let's bring this back down to something more reasonable, like plastic, and. Uh, Something like that will work reasonably well. Um, you know, plastics, glass, water, things like that, they tend to have uh, much lower numbers. Um, and then metals tend to be very high numbers. So we'll be sliding this slider really high up when we uh, create some metals in a second. Um, so we can go over here to this next object. And if we want to do the same thing, you know, we can make a V-Ray material here. I go in and I can say orange block mat, but it would really be a waste of time to you know have to change all those settings again. Uh, so we can use a V-Ray preset here, and these presets can be really handy. Um, so we can just go to our first material, and if we go into that one, we find the presets button right here. And if I want to save this off, I can just click on it, hit save V-Ray material preset. I'll call this uh, green block mat. It's just the default, and that's fine. I'll just use it because that's the material name. Uh, and I'll go to this other one, and I'll choose presets. I'll choose that same green block mat. All right, and now it's just a simple matter of changing the color. So if I want them both to be plastic blocks, then I could just come in here. Pick a different color. Yeah, that's working pretty well. There we go. Um, now, finally, we're going to uh, change the ground object a little bit. Uh, just with slightly less boring, I'll just add a, you know, a slight bit of reflection on it as well. So I could right click on here and say assign new material. V-Ray material, 
to turn this up so it's you know fairly bright, but I want to actually be able to see a reflection a little bit, so I don't want it to be too bright. Um, I'm going to go in here into the reflection color, and I'm going to turn this up somewhat, and I'm going to turn the glossiness down, but only down just a really small amount, so that they're still pretty sharp reflections. There we go. And we can change that Fresnel IOR just a little bit again. Um, if I turn it up, the reflections will become just a little bit more noticeable. And I come up to the top and uh, you know just edit that diffuse color a bit. And I'm just going to effectively try to bring this down so that I can you know see those reflections just a little. And the scene, the whole scene doesn't look too washed out. So we should be we should be starting to see just a little bit of reflection in there. No, I don't want too much. I just want a little bit. So that's effectively going to come from just you know turning up the reflection color, and turning the diffuse color down a little. Okay. It's subtle, but it's just a little bit there. So I think that's what I want. Yeah. So if we'd like to see a metal material in here as well, I can create, um, you know, just kind of a basic sort of steel and chrome materials here. So uh, to do that, I'll just use a couple spheres, uh, since they'll show this fairly well. So let's go to create polygon primitives uh, sphere. I'll we'll say chrome ball. And I'll give this a radius. Let's try 16. Yeah, that's good. So we'll just move this up onto the ground. Uh, I'll give it some more um, subdivisions as well. Uh, there we go. This one looks really nice and round. Uh, and it's going to need to be round to really kind of show us the reflections the way we want to see them. So I can right click on this object and we can say assign new material, V ray material. So I'll call it Chrome Ball Mat, and then we'll set this up to start looking like, uh, you know, like Chrome. So we can go to our diffuse color here and turn this way down, since Chrome, you know, has almost no sort of diffuse scattered light, and even that's going to be too bright for the diffuse color. So we can actually go to our amount and slide that down even further, just to get this really, really dark in terms of its diffuse coloring. It should be very, very, very little. Um, and then we can go over to this reflection section. Um, I'm going to recommend uh, for this BRDF type that you change this. Uh, in fact, I think most of the time it's going to be best to change this. Uh, GGX tends to be very effective. It can work with a very wide range of materials. Um, and I actually normally change pretty much every, every object's reflection model to being this GGX type. Uh, it's just a lot easier to control than most of the other ones, uh, particularly because the glossiness, the sensitivity of this glossiness slider works a lot better when you've got it set to this GGX setting. Um, it's just the particular math that's used for the reflections, but in my opinion, it's the best one available in V-Ray right now. Um, so we can set that and then go to the reflection glossiness. So it's 100% perfectly infinitely sharp reflection right now. Uh, and chrome would be a fairly sharp reflection, but it wouldn't be that sharp. So we can turn that down just a small little bit. There we go. That's better. Um, and then finally, and this is the main difference between things like chrome and you know plastic and glass and whatnot, is that um, the IOR for the reflection is going to be very, very different for chrome. Um, the reflection for chrome is basically just going to be everywhere. It's not going to uh, show up more on the parts of the object that are, you know, facing sideways from the camera. Uh, you know, things like plastic and glass and stuff, their reflections are going to be a lot stronger uh, at those glancing angles. Uh, but something like chrome, its reflections are going to be really strong everywhere. So the way to get that is to just, again, we'll turn off this lock Fresnel IOR to refraction IOR. 
because that way we get to use this slider. And we'll take that and crank this way up. Now you're gonna see that it maxes out around 10 here. There's a lot of times when you'll actually wanna go even farther than this for materials. Um, you know, for something like Chrome, it's not unreasonable to punch in like a crazy high number. Um, you know, 30 might be a little bit extreme. You know, let's try like 17. Um, but you know, that actually works pretty well. And then uh, to get another sort of, you know, less perfectly reflective um, sort of steel here, what I'll do is I'll just duplicate this and, uh, and move it over. I'll call this steel ball. And this will be like a less perfectly polished kind of a object. So we'll right click on here, uh, assign new material choose V-Ray material. Uh, and since our Chrome is already really close to what we want, we'll just click over on the Chrome ball and go to presets, save V-Ray material preset, and just save that Chrome material off. Because um, now I can go to this one, which is steel ball mat. So I've named the material and we'll go to the presets I will choose that Chrome one and choose replace to completely replace its presets. You know, so now it just looks like Chrome. Um, you know, so the main difference with this one is just going to be that the reflection is not going to be as bright, um, but more importantly, that it's not going to be nearly as sharp a reflection. So we can go to our reflection gl glossiness here and just bring it way down, and then bring our reflection um, either the reflection color down or you could bring the amount down instead. There we go. So I don't want it to, to be too blurry. You know, I still want to be able to make out you know, some form, uh, but I want it to be a you know much darker, much darker look, and you know somewhat blurry. If I wanted to make a gold material or something, it would be very similar to this. I would just adjust the glossiness a little bit, you know, differently and change the reflection color. Um, actually, really, the main difference between materials like plastic and glass, uh, which are called dielectrics, um, and then other more metallic materials, um, is the fact that, you know, in addition to this IOR um, being quite different between them on average, um, the other thing is that metallic objects tend to be tinted in their reflection color. So, you know, the green plastic still has a white reflection color. But, you know, a, a colored metal like gold is going to have, um, you know, a, a very different re a reflection color because the reflection color is it's not going to be white. It's going to be that tinted gold reflection color. Um, so if I want to make a gold ball here, I'll just do the same thing. and I'll grab this, duplicate it, um, move it over a little bit. I'll call this gold ball. Make a new V-Ray material for it. Um, and then I'll start by using the presets that I had on the last one. So go over to the presets, grab that chrome ball material. And then to make this into a gold, we'll do something pretty similar to what I did last time, where I'll just bring the glossiness down. And then I'll go to my reflection color here. Um, you know, this is the part that's uh, really different from the other objects so far, is that, you know, with metals, I would heavily tint this, whatever color the metal was. So I'll just take this and change our tint to be really extreme. Now, it shouldn't necessarily be this bright, so it should be pretty tinted. Um, but this is obviously way brighter than it needs to be. So I can bring this down, 
you know, kind of find a find a good spot there. Of course, different kinds of gold based on exactly uh, you know what it's made of and everything um, are going to be somewhat different in terms of settings here. But you know, if you explore this sort of range of settings, um, you know, with fairly uh, you know fairly fairly colorful uh, reflection, and then uh, you know just play with the glossiness, then you should be able to mimic whatever kind of gold you're going for. Um, and you could do the same thing with, you know, copper or, uh, you know, pretty much any other kind of metal. So the last kind of material that I'll create here is a glass material. So for the glass material, um, you know, yet again, I'll just duplicate one of these spheres. Move it over. I'll call this glass ball. And this will actually be a solid glass ball. Um, there's a lot of times if you were to see a glass ball, um, you know, it would just be an outer shell of glass and the whole thing wouldn't be full. Um, you know, this is going to be glass all the way through, very much like a marble. So I'll right click on this, assign new material, um, create a V-Ray material. Call this glass ball mat. Uh, and to set up our glass material, our diffuse color, again, is just going to come way down because there's almost no diffuse color in glass. So we'll turn this really, really, really low. Um, and then our reflection color, well, this will actually be cranked really high. There we go. Okay, so we'll have an incredibly high reflection color. Now you're going to notice that it's not very strong uh, right near the front, but it starts to get sort of brighter on the edges here. Um, and that's because of our uh, Fresnel angle. Um, we can turn off the lock Fresnel IOR to refraction IOR. This is actually the one situation which we don't really want to do this because it's glass. We want the reflection and the refraction to be the same. Um, so normally we turn this button off so that we don't have to scroll way down here into the refraction options and change this number. Because actually changing this number here would do the same thing as if we turned this button off and then change this. And you'll actually see if I go into the bottom down here and I punch in something like 1.5 and then I scroll back up, um, you know, this will, even if it doesn't say 1.5 here, this will actually now, um, you know, the Fresnel IOR for the, for, the refraction, for the reflection and the refraction is now gonna be at 1.5. Um, so, you know, whether or not it actually updates and shows it here, uh, once you type in 1.5 in here, if this checkbox is active, right, then this here is overriding the setting. Um, and then all of our other objects have been solid, so we've had no reason to deal with this refraction setting. But when we have a material that's transparent, real world materials, uh, when they're transparent, they transmit and they refract light. So in our refraction settings down here, we can say that our refraction color for this material is very, very high. You know, it's very, very close to just being completely white. Um, you know, 1.5 is a reasonable number for glass. Their default of 1.6 is also very reasonable. I think that's actually why they have their default at 1.6, uh, because that's a very reasonable glass. Uh, different kinds of glass are going to have different exact IORs, but anywhere from like 1.4 to 1.6 is probably very reasonable uh, for different kinds. So, uh, you know, we could change this number a little and then right now we have absolutely a perfect reflection on here so of course in real life um, you know glass wouldn't be 100 percent perfect in terms of its reflectivity so you might want to um, you know turn that down to introduce just a slight amount of blur into the reflections since right now they're just infinitely sharp reflections they're just they're basically just 100% perfect. Um, you know, no glass in real life would be that perfect. Um, so you can turn this down. Even if you turn it to a very, very high number, just, you know, take it off of absolute one a little bit. Uh, that'll help. Uh, and then um, we could do the same thing with the refraction glossiness. Uh, the other thing is that that might potentially slow it down quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the reflection uh, glossiness, you know, that uh, making that, a number lower than one will slow it down as well but uh, the refraction glossiness when you turn that down it tends to be like an even bigger um, 
time sink than the reflection glossiness. Um, turning down the refraction glossiness it will effectively give you something kind of like frosted glass, uh, but you'll also see that it's potentially very, very slow. So if we turn this on and we grab our render region right here, um, I can use this button here to just render a small area. And since I only really need to be working with this area, if I turn on render region and then I just click and I draw a box, um, then I can be working on just that area. Um, so now I can go in here and I can find my refraction glossiness, right? And we can try turning this way down. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that that's just going to blur out everything inside of there, right? Which is a really cool effect. And there's a lot of glass in real life that's like that, that, you know, is really blurry when you look through it. Um, that is also something that, that is potentially uh, incredibly slow. Uh, generally speaking, when it's, um, you know, low glossiness with these blurry refractions, generally speaking, you're also probably going to have um, blurry reflections and you're going to want to turn this glossiness down sort of a similar amount. Um, Again, uh, this can be really extraordinarily time consuming to render. So, you know, in a lot of situations, I think you'll find that even if you want to back the reflection glossiness off a little bit, you might decide to just keep your reflection glossiness all the way at one. Um, you know, of course, in real life, pretty much nothing is that perfectly uh, glossy for the refraction. You know, everything's going to be slightly imperfect. And you could try backing that off just a little bit. Um, but I think in a lot of situations, it's fine to just leave this at one um, and just back the reflection off a little bit to make it seem slightly less perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off my render region here again. Uh, just so we can see the whole thing. Good. And yeah, we can see that as we look through this you know, glass it's refracting the light and you know we're seeing reflections and refractions of the things around it um you know it's it tends to kind of look flipped upside down uh and real glass actually does that if you looked at a solid glass ball you'll see a lot of things that look like they're upside down in it uh, and that's just the way it bends the light um so that's actually correct uh yeah so what we can do at this point uh now that we have a reasonably good um good setup here is we could look into uh cleaning up our render settings because uh, we need to get a render that isn't uh you know, that isn't really noisy. We need to get a really clean render for this, and there's, we're still getting a lot of grain in here. And this is just the IPR render. Um, so we need to set this up um, to do some actual rendering. And we also need to know that this is looking accurate, because this might not even be accurate, because I've been using the IPR the whole time. Um, now I've been explicitly <laughs> going out of my way to use settings that I know should be about the same in the actual renderer. Uh, but it's worth noting that, uh, you know, doing this and going really far with the IPR uh, alone, you know, is potentially a really big problem because you could get yourself cornered in a situation where you, you know, spent tons of time making things look just precisely the way you want in the IPR, and then you go and you check your actual render and it looks different. Um, and in many cases, you'll find that maybe the reason you're having a hard time getting things to look right in the IPR is because you were using settings that weren't properly supported in the IPR, uh, such as like subsurface scattering or something like that. Um, you know, so do be aware of that. The IPR isn't always going to be accurate. Uh, and we're going to switch over to um, uh, to the the real renderer uh, in a minute here, um, and it is something that you want to be checking out frequently. So you know I've gone pretty far without doing that, but you know generally speaking, it's a good habit to uh, be going and you know checking things out in your real renderer every now and then. Uh, and it's not that hard to do. I mean, in this situation, I can just do a regular render, and it should look almost the same. Um, and right now I haven't changed any of the render settings, so they're just pretty much at the default. So I can hit that button right there. Um, when it does the real render, uh, we're gonna change some settings to sort of accelerate the global illumination, accelerate the bouncing of the light so the computer can figure it out faster. Uh, one of the ones that's already turned on by default is this thing called the light cache, and that's why you can see it sort of go over the whole thing first. Um, preparing that light cache, and then it'll sort of start rendering it again. Um, and it's using the progressive settings here, um, which are not at all what we want. Um, but we can see that in general, the scene does, you know, look approximately correct. Uh, so we'll be able to, um, you know, tweak our settings and get kind of a clean render of this uh, without too much trouble. So if we go into our render settings here, 
the main things that we're going to deal with here are our image sampling um, and our GI settings. Uh, but there's one other thing that's actually slowing us down uh, right now, which is that in our actual settings tab over here, if we open up the default displacement subdivision section, we can see that our max subdivs says 256. Um, that is a number that controls just how round V-Ray tries to make things uh, when you use the smooth mesh preview. Uh, and that number right now is just way too high. Uh, chances are in most scenes, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to get away with a number like 12 and everything will look just fine. V-Ray tends to just really go overkill on this by default and you don't need it to be nearly as high as the defaults are normally going to make it, um, you know. So I can go down to a very low number. What's going to happen is, is almost everything is still going to look fine. In some cases, you might find that certain objects, uh, you know, need a need a higher number than what you've put in here. And if that's the case, what I tend to do is just go to those individual objects and make it higher. Um, it's not weird though in a complicated scene to double your render speed with no visible difference, just by changing this from something like 256, you know, to a number like 12. There's a very good chance that uh, that you will never notice the visual difference, um, but uh, what is going to be happening is that you're going to be um, rendering so many less polygons because with a number like 256 in there, you know, uh, V-Ray is subdividing your entire scene, you know, into probably millions of polygons, um, you know, maybe tens of millions of polygons. This is potentially a really big problem. Uh, so by turning this down, we can get things a lot lower um, and start to render a lot faster. So back in the V-Ray settings here, um, we're going to have to work with this image sampler. Um, so right now it's set to progressive. Uh, progressive is really good for doing previews because it uh, starts off uh, very poor and then continues making it look better as you wait, a lot like the IPR does. Thing is that when you're doing a final render, uh, that's not really you, what you really want to do. When you're doing a final render, you want to hit a level of quality that actually looks good, uh, and then you want to move on and you want to go over to the next frame or whatever. Um, so what we can do is we can uh, change our sampler type, and there's a few different ones. Um, and I've done a lot of experimentation with this, and I've read uh, quite a bit about it. And what I can say is that in most situations with modern render, with you know fairly complex textures, models, you know, effects, like, you know, complicated materials, soft reflections, soft shadows, stuff like that. When you're looking at, you know, a lot of modern real world scenes, um, this adaptive one is by far, uh, the by far most commonly the, the best option. Um, there are certain situations in which fixed rate or possibly adaptive subdivision uh, will work better. They tend to be really special cases um, most of the time when you're dealing with a real world scene, you're going to find that adaptive works really well. It's, it's usually the best at, at hitting what you need to hit. So I'm going to switch over to that adaptive here. Um, now by default, um, the settings here are fairly low um, and will render reasonably quickly. Um, but there's a major problem in the fact that uh, we can tend to get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of noise from uh, things like blurry reflections and soft shadows and stuff. Uh, with these numbers, um, you know, and how much noise is acceptable to you, you know, really depends on your budget, you know, your target audience, what you're using the render for, is it a still, is it an animation, you know, lots of other criteria like that. Um, but, you know, we're just going to try to get a, a render that, uh, that I think looks pretty clean. So these default settings, um, you know, they're potentially useful, but they're probably not nearly high enough. Um, you know, this is probably still going to look, you know, in my opinion, like kind of preview level quality. Um, so ultimately, we're going to have to turn this up. But just having this is a decent start for now. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go into our GI tab here. Um, and we're going to see that uh, reason global illumination uh, right here, we have a couple different engines and one is the primary bounces and the other is the secondary bounces and the primary bounce is just the first time that light bounces and how the computer is going to calculate that and uh, the next one is all like the further bounces of light you know how is the computer going to deal with uh, light bouncing around more than that um, now normally the computer would just do ray tracing for every single bounce of the light and that is what you get if you just set both of them to brute force now that is very accurate, but it is also potentially very, very slow. 
Um, so what we will often do, um, you know, in real production is it will, we'll want to render things faster because we just can't afford that much time. Uh, so we'll often uh, find that by using other methods to accelerate it, we'll be able to get images that look, you know, almost as good, really similar, but render in drastically less time. Uh, and in my opinion, most of the time right now using Yuri and a lot of, uh, you know, most sort of modern shots and such, it works quite well uh, to use a combination of uh, something called an irradiance map for the primary bounces, and then for the secondary bounces, you use the light cache, which is already the default setting in V-Ray. Um, so right up here in our primary bounces, uh, this is what we're going to change. And we're effectively, we're just going to pick this uh, irradiance map right here. Um, and this is going to accelerate the computation of those first bounces. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to trade a little bit of accuracy uh, for this faster render. Um, because what, we, what we'll be doing is we'll be blurring out that first bounce of light just a little bit. So using this irradiance map, it's going to not quite render it quite as accurately um, as it would if we rendered for a really, really long time on the brute force settings. Um, but at the same time, this should let us get um, you know a reasonably good-looking non-grainy image uh, where we've you know already where we've gotten rid of most of the noise. This should let us get something like that you know in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so we can turn that on, and then uh, finally. Uh, if we scroll down here in the irradiance map, um, al although most of these settings are pretty good, they're, they're, they're fine for our, our purposes today, uh, there is an option that we can uh, find in here. Uh, we can turn on, and just for now, so that we can see what we're doing, we'll turn on this option for show direct light. Uh, what you'll see if you don't turn this button on uh, is that when you do a render, let's just choose a little region here again. And then I'll, uh, I'll do a small little render here. And you can see that it renders. And then it goes really dark. And it does this next render pass. And that actually is the computer calculating that irradiance map that I was talking about. The thing is that it's kind of, um, uh, it could potentially be kind of confusing. And you can't tell if it's sort of doing things in the right way uh, when it darkens stuff like that. Because you can't see the direct light. So it's really hard to know if it's working. Um, particularly, you know, very much when you're doing your tests. Even when you're close to the end of the process doing your tests. Uh, you want to be able to bail early, you know, by hitting escape and cancel the render if you can tell that things just aren't working the way you want. Uh, and it's really hard to tell when it all darkens like that for the irradiance map. So I strongly recommend that you turn on this show direct light, at least until you do your very final renders. Um, you know, strictly speaking, this slows down your render slightly, but it's really, really minimal. Um, so in most situations, I, th I think it's, uh, it's completely worth just turning that on. Um, but, you know... It, if you're worried about it in your absolute final renders, then yeah, you can turn it off when you actually render your finished image, and your final render will go slightly faster. But it's uh, it doesn't tend to be a huge difference, and it's a lot easier to tell what you're doing when that button is turned on. Because now, if I render it, now we're gonna we're not gonna see it go really dark like that. So I'm gonna more sort of the whole time gonna have a general idea of how bright everything is. Okay, so this is working okay. There is some graininess in here. It's not too terrible. Um, but it's also not that great. <laughs> we can uh, render another little area here. Uh, and there might be some situations where we think that is good and that's just fine. Uh, and then there might be other situations where you know you think it's too noisy and you need a you need a little bit more uh, sampling. Uh, and that's where we will change the adaptive samples. Uh, to work a little bit better with that. So at this point, what I just go do is I'd you know go through my scene and I'd look at different sections, you know, see how good they look or how bad they look, and decide you know where I'm probably going to need more. There we go. Um, you know, in this even at my current settings, you know, is looking a little bit grainy. I think I'd like to clean that up a little bit for sure. Um, So in order to do this, um, we're going to use these uh, subdivision controls here. Now what I'm going to start with is, just to show how this works, um, the max subdivs here, um, I'm going to turn up quite high, you know, way higher than we need them to be, something like 64. And then I'm going to take our threshold and I'm going to turn that up really, really high as well. Incredibly high, like 10. What this is going to do is, 
when our threshold is at a really high number like this, it's going to almost always render using the minimum quality here, which means it's effectively rendering um, with only one of these adaptive samples, which is sort of the minimum that it can do. So on most pixels, it's really not going to work very hard. So I can uh, give it a render here again, and I can zoom in, right? And we can see that like, it still looks pretty terrible. Um, you know, even though I've got my max subdivs up at 64. So, you know, here's the sort of, the sort of lowest quality, here's the highest quality. Uh, well, this threshold determines how much error the, the computer is willing to accept before it starts rendering more and starts using some of the, and starts, uh, starts working towards this maximum level of quality that we're choosing here, uh, which obviously is going to be slower and take longer. Um, but because this number is so high, it's not even going to try to, uh, you know, to get close to the 64. It's just almost always going to render with like the bare minimum possible. Uh, you're going to see this gets a tiny bit better as I take this number lower. Um, you know, even at one, it's going to be pretty disgusting. It'll probably look pretty terrible there. Yeah, not working very well. Um, effectively, as I just keep getting this number lower and lower, we'll see our render getting cleaner and cleaner. A bit better, uh, you know, their default number is 0 0.01. Uh, even that number is a little high, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of times when that is grainier than you want it to be. I mean, sometimes that's going to be fine, um, other times it's really not going to be. Um, you know, in this situation, you know, is this grain too much? Is it acceptable? You know, it's, it's debatable. I would like this to be cleaned up just a little bit more. It really depends on your render time, budget, whatnot. Um, but we're moving towards our, you know, max uh, quality at this point. Um, now, if I turn up our max quality higher, it should make very, very little difference in terms of render time because I think that what's happening uh, most of the time right now is that the threshold is getting reached where it gets sort of everything at good enough quality long before it even comes close to hitting this maximum subdivision. So if I think if I hit like 99 in here, I don't think that's gonna make it uh, significantly slower. And let's just try here. You know, I could probably punch in a thousand there and it would not make any significant difference um, because we're getting so close uh, just by using the uh, the threshold number. You know, like that's about the same render time as we were looking at last time. Um, you know, I could even probably put another nine in here um, and we're probably not even really going to see much of a difference. Um, so really this threshold is controlling your quality, and then the max is just what is the absolute hardest uh, working, uh, or what is the absolute sort of most work that you will ever allow the computer to do on, uh, on a given pixel. Um, you know, a number, a number like 16, in my opinion, is okay but pretty low a number like 64 is you know very high uh and is is generally um is generally almost always going to be enough as uh to reach your threshold if you have your threshold as something reasonable um you know numbers in between there you know can be can be reasonable depending on what you're doing um but i tend to like you know i i tend to like using this threshold number for that because this, this threshold number gives you a really good level of control over it so something like 0 0.005, uh, that can work quite well. Uh, and now if I go in and I choose, say, an area like that, we can do that again. And now I'm just losing a little bit more noise. Uh, if I go even lower, like 0 0.001, well, now it renders slower, but now it's really clean and it's really noise-free. Um, you know, because that really should be sort of a, a smooth transition there that should not be noisy uh, so this is really just dependent on um, you know what amount of render time that I can accept um, let's go in here and let's see how let's see if I can get these max subdivs a lot lower and still looking good so if I try like 24 and 0 0.001 yeah. so yeah even with a number like that it's still working um, you know very well I probably never need more than that, you know. Um, I do think 16 is probably not quite enough, but we'll try. Well, in this case, 16 is actually pretty good. Let's try four. 
four is probably not sufficient. Um, so really, we can just play with these numbers, try to find something that works, you know, reasonably well. Um, again, if you just have your threshold a little bit higher, then it won't matter as much what this number is. But I do try to make sure that this number is not incredibly high. Um, so I'll, I'll generally check for the noisiest parts of my scenes, the, the parts that I think are the absolute worst. Um, you know, this little area here is potentially a little bit bad. Um, you know, a soft shadow would be potentially bad. Um, these blurry, these blurry reflections and uh, these blurry reflections are in many cases, you know, probably just the, the most difficult thing in my, in this particular scene to render. So, you know, I, I check areas like that. And I try to find a nice balance for these numbers that, uh, you know, gets it clean and as, and that gets it as clean as possible within a reasonable amount of time. And it's just really a trade-off of quality versus time. And you're just trying to hit a nice, you're trying to hit the right balance where it's not a ridiculous amount of time. Um, and it, you know, it looks good. Uh, you know, some cases, there are some kinds of scenes that are just very, very render intensive. And depending on what it is that you're doing, um, you know, certain kinds of scenes can cause the render to be incredibly slow. Um, this scene I chose on purpose because it's it's not the kind of scene that should be very slow to render. A scene like this should render pretty fast. Outdoor lighting is one of the easier things for the computer to do. Um, we don't have a lot of you know, complexity in here or anything either, so it works pretty well. Um, so I can see that. Uh, if I want to compare my noise, I can hit this H here to uh, enable a history. And then I can hit the uh, save button right here. If I can click on it. Uh, when you turn when you when you turn on, the, on this H, if you haven't used it before, it might ask you like where you want to save your um, your temporary preview files. If that's the case, you know just make a V-Ray folder um, or V-Ray previews folder, you know, in your project or pretty much anywhere else on your computer that you don't care about. You can just delete it later if you want. Um, but it'll just save those uh, preview images right here. Um, so let's go to our max subdivs here and let's turn this number up, strike 20, render. There you go. So definitely a little bit slower than uh, last time I think, but we can do a check here. Pretty minimal difference. Just a little bit better. You know, probably at around 18 or something like that, we're probably starting to hit the point of diminishing returns. Uh, and that's very much controlled by that threshold. So. Anyway, this is the noisiest area of my scene. Um, Something like that looks pretty good to me. So I can use, you know, uh, min subdiv uh, 1, max subdiv uh, 16, and a threshold of 0 0.003. I think that'll be sufficient for this scene. There we go. Uh, and then finally, uh, we want to see how this works at a full, re at a, um, a full resolution render. So what I'm going to do is I'm again uh, just going to use this preview uh, uh, of the render regions to see how my full uh, full size render is working without actually rendering the entire picture. So let's go over to our V-Ray Common tab here, and for my presets, I'll choose uh, HD1080. There we go. Let's close this uh, history part of the window. And now we'll render this again. Okay, uh, and I'm just I'm only waiting long enough uh, so that I can see what's where in this picture, uh, just so that I can turn on the render region, and then uh, you know find one of those areas that was you know looking pretty noisy before. Uh, 
you know, potentially just a really small area like that. Because this is going to be pretty slow to render because I'm, I'm rendering at full render settings here. So we could try this out. We could possibly adjust our, you know, threshold and noise a little bit more. The thing is that when you're doing a really high res render, um, uh, particularly you know, if it's really high res, if it's even higher resolution than this, uh, when you have a lot of pixels, you tend to be able to tolerate a little bit more noise because there's so many pixels that the noise, um, you know, isn't as noticeable. Um, but in this case, you know, I'm going for something pretty clean, and you know, this is working. This is working pretty well. So it's it's there is some noise when I get in really close there, but I don't think it's something that the audience is going to notice, and I don't think it's something that I'm you know really going to notice in that final render. Uh, and I could turn that up, but it would slow it down a fair amount if I you know turn the samples up or turn the threshold down. Um, and I don't. I think I'd have to turn it fairly far and get a render quite a bit slower before I really started seeing a really significant difference. So I think this will probably be good enough for now. So uh, I'll do another. I'll do a render um, of the full scene at this quality, uh, and I won't make make you wait for it. I'll basically skip ahead in the video, uh, but I'll come in here and I'll render this, and we'll see what it looks like in a second. So here's our final render um, at the full resolution with our final settings. It looks pretty clean. There's a small amount of noise in here, but I think it's pretty reasonable. I don't think it's something that is uh, highly noticeable. Uh, so hopefully this has given you a good grounding in uh, some of the basic principles in V-Ray rendering. So we'll continue in future lessons using more complicated materials and more complicated scenes. Thanks for watching. See you next time.